Good morning, saints. Welcome to worship. How is it with your souls this fine day? It is well. Today is Noisy Can Offering Sunday, so here come the troops. I have a few announcements that I'll share while you're emptying your pockets and your purses and whatever else. This is a good way to make a joyful noise, don't you think? Okay. I have a few announcements that I want to share. Just raise your hand if you've got money. Every hand should be up. Go for it. Okay. The church board is having a brief meeting in the conference room off the office after worship this morning. Next Sunday, maybe I should wait. <laughs> it's too nice. I like it. I like being drowned out. That's a good sound. us this we know for the Bible tells us so right right Oh, that's not a religious song, is it? <laughs> oh, whoops. Dance the music. <laughs> All right, friends. A few announcements. Bear with me. Um, this morning, the board's going to meet briefly in the conference room off the office after worship. One short item of business. Next Sunday will be a cleanup day. There's a sign up sheet on the center table that Tom has put together, and the task can be done during the week or on Sunday, um, sort of in the after faith formation time. And so if you have any questions about any of that, talk to Tom, but there's a pencil back there, a pen you can sign up. Next Sunday also, Brenda, you wanted to make an announcement, or Deb? No, it's gonna be Brenda. Oh, it's gonna be Brenda, okay. <laughs> Go ahead and take the, the red mic. Okay. Uh, my hand is working. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just talk loud. Next Sunday, um, we're going to have kind of a church giveaway. We've been cleaning out closets <coughs> and Tom and I, so that we'll have stuff out there. We just want people to take it. And also, the United um, Women in Faith are going to have a dessert. Um, kind of just a donation thing. We're going to bring in some dessert. So just be kind of a little social. We're going to have sweets and free stuff. So, And some will be outside by the garage, too. Oh, very good. And you'll take volunteers to bring more desserts, yes, right? Yes, and we need oh, volunteers yeah. for desserts. We have so fuel for cleanup day and an opportunity to give toward mission work. Yes, yes indeed. Exciting. Okay. okay. There's another sign-up sheet next to the yard cleanup sign-up sheet. And um, we have um, a person who's moved into the community, a woman who's moved to Regency from a, care, a place in Winterset, and she'd like a ride to church. She doesn't have a car. And so if you'd be willing to be part of a group of people um, who would rotate, uh, be willing to go get her on Sunday mornings and connect with her to make sure she's able and ready to go, um, please sign up on the sheet back there. So. 
Um, no, but we'll, Joanne has the contact information and whoever signs up will make sure that they get that and that we get the information to her so she knows what to expect, okay? All right. Um, the final thing um, for announcement time is, um, it's also a prayer matter. Um, Phil Van Vliet died on Friday morning and his service will be here um, at 10.30 on Thursday morning and a visitation at Isles here in Norwalk from five to seven on Wednesday evening. So we'll have Joni and her family in our prayers this morning. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. Are there any other announcements that need to be shared as we enter into worship this morning? All right then, friends, our opening praise is we know that Christ is raised. It's number 610 in your hymnal if you want the tune and we'll sing verses one and two. great truth. I am the gate for the sheep. We have heard these words before. We recognize this voice. Welcome in Christ. You belong. In Christ you are loved and safe. This, this is the voice of our shepherd. Follow and find green pastures and still waters. His voice calls and leads us. Christ comes to give and give it abundantly. Thanks be to God who loves, calls, and leads us. Join now in God is Love, hymn number 660, to the tune of God is Here. Yep. Words on the screen. Sing 
be seated. Risen Savior, faithful shepherd, we hear your voice calling us to follow. Today we gather in prayer and praise, even as we give thanks for the faithful witness of our ancestors in the faith. Enliven us with your resurrection power. Free us from despair, discouragement, and indifference. Enliven us with your abundant life, so that your living power flows through us in all we are and do. In Christ we pray. Amen. Reading from the scripture of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all, as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. From Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. And after the next scripture reading, I will come around and pick up any prayer cards. For it is a credit to you from 1 Peter chapter 2, 19 through 25. For it is a credit to you if being aware of God, you endure pain while suffering unjustly. If you endure when you are beaten for doing wrong, what credit is that? But if you endure when you do right and suffer for it, you have God's approval. For to this you have been called. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that free from sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you are, were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of, our, of your souls. Today's special music is I See God by the Fifth Sunday Singers.
Our gospel reading this morning comes from John chapter 10. This is the first part of the Good Shepherd chapter. Amen. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Ascends this reading of the good news. Let us pray. Beloved Lord, thank you for your presence with us for the gift of life in this new day. We thank you for your word in which you reveal yourself and your way to us. Dwell in us richly now that we may be faithful in our meditations and learn from you so that we can follow our Lord rejoicing. It is in his name we pray. Amen. This Peter, first Peter passage has been bugging me all week, so I decided I had to preach on it. <laughs> the adventure begins, yes? So bear with me. Because it comes with baggage, significant baggage. Now, the text as we read it is prettied up in the lectionary. That often happens, you know, that the stuff that's hard to understand and interpret gets kind of weeded out. So this is the fun of reading the whole Bible, right? You discover all this stuff you never heard before. What makes this text, actually this book, problematic is not dissimilar to what sometimes makes other parts of the scriptures difficult. And that is that there are parts of the teaching in this word that have been used in ways that have been destructive and used unapologetically by Christians throughout history. So we enter into meditation on this scripture with a heavy dose, if you will, of first humility because we're not the, first, the Christians for whom this was written and also because it's easy, you know, to stand in history and second guess our ancestors, right? And also because we know coming into this our own ignorance about uh, not only history, but about the way life works. Isn't it true that as we continue to grow and change, our perspectives on what is important and how we need to live and act in the world also changes with us and our experiences shape us and certainly our walk with God continues to shape us throughout our lives so that we look at something now that we read 15 years ago or heard about or talked about 15 years ago and we come at it with some of that knowledge but also with fresh eyes because we're different people now, right? And so what are the problematic pieces? A, a few of them, we won't dwell on them deeply, but what are some of the problematic pieces that are in this? Well. The first one is verse 18, right before our text, which says, slaves accept the authority of your masters with all deference. And another one, chapter three, verse one, wives in the same way accept the authority of your husbands. And a little further down in the chapter, show consideration husbands for your wives in your life together and pay honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. <laughs> and there are some other texts in there. 
that are things about respecting the authority of the emperor. Always submit yourself to the authority of the governing bodies, right? Okay. So, isn't this fun? <laughs> and we have to acknowledge, I think, don't we, that we know we have written examples, historic examples, in our not too distant history and in other times in history where texts like this have been used to bring harm to people, really to dehumanize them, right? So we have ample evidence of Christians um, who, and preachers among them, and bishops among them, and some of our so-called founding fathers, who were slave owners and used the scripture as a way to justify keeping people in enslavement. See, it's here in the Bible, right? And women, <laughs> yeah, and Times in history when despots, predatory, authoritarian, authoritarian rulers used scriptures like this as a way to keep the church quiet as they did their dirty work. This was certainly a tool that Hitler employed well, but we have other examples in history also. And because we aren't those people in that place, we don't know how they balanced the evil that they saw unfolding before them and this way of interpreting and lifting up the scripture and the call of the gospel to stand against evil, right? And that call does not change for us. And so this text and its call for obedience and humility really rubs, doesn't it, in the face of these truths about our history. We know that empires that decided that they had a destiny to colonize other places in the world not only had an economic agenda, take over the land and then you can do whatever you want with their resources, but there was also a cultural and religious angle to it a conviction of the superiority of Christianity and the desire to put down so-called pagan uncivilized people who were already inhabiting the land. And we know how well that has gone, right? And so here we are with a scripture that has been used as a way to bring harm. We have to say it, it's true. So how do we come to this text then and receive a word that can bring life and instruction for the challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day lives? So first, let's set the scene just a bit and make it a little more personal. And friends, if any of this is triggering for, triggering for you, I invite you to just exit out mentally or just to remember that you're in a safe place because God is with you. I think to understand first the harm and then the bringing of life, it may be helpful for us to bring to mind an event or a time when we were bullied or when the actions of others brought shame and humiliation to us. Naming a time in our lives when our voice was discounted as unimportant. And when no matter what we said about our own truth, the truth of our experience or what we were thinking or feeling, no one thought that it was of enough value to pay attention to. Right? And certainly, it shouldn't be considered in any actions that might affect us, right? Because hmm? it's not important. There, there, dear, you're just a woman. You don't know what's best for you. Right? Or, I'm your master. You do what you're told. Consequences. Hmm? 
We don't know a lot about the community to whom the epistles of Peter were written, but we do know a couple of things. One is that they considered themselves to be exiles and aliens in the place where they were planted. They had been displaced and were now in a place where they were experiencing hostility. Another culture that did not understand them certainly had no understanding of what it meant to follow Jesus and no interest in it. And, and where slavery was practiced as it was throughout the Roman culture, We also know from the way people are addressed in this passage that the majority of people in these house churches or this region <coughs> to whom these letters were addressed were probably slaves themselves. So they were not in a position, most of them, to have big impact on the wider world, right? Not in the culture in which they were living. And so their marginal marginalization is part of what First Peter is trying to address. You feel like you have no agency over your life, he says, but dot, dot, dot. And that's where we begin. We're helped here, I think, by the Gospel of John because consider how Jesus characterizes himself and his ministry now, this is right after the healing of the blind man, where it's pretty clear nobody really still understands who Jesus is and what he's about, right? And so he's underlining the point by making another I am statement about himself. I am the shepherd. He draws on imagery from the prophets, from the Psalms, where the prophets contrasted God as shepherd, the faithful shepherd, with the unfaithful shepherds who were ruling over Israel in whatever time they were speaking. God, the faithful shepherd, who cares for the sheep, who in fact loves the sheep, who wants the sheep to know God's voice and wants them to live abundant lives, right? So we hear about the heart of God and the kind of relationship that God wants to have with God's sheep, and we're invited to see ourselves as those sheep, brambles in our wool and all. Mm -hmm. And then he also says he is the gate. In an interesting mixed metaphor, which I won't go into here, sometimes he's the gate and sometimes he's the shepherd who walks through the gate. That's the mix, right? But the gatekeeper's job was to keep the sheep safe in an enclosure during the night so thieves and predators could not get at the sheep. And usually these enclosures were connected to the house and often multiple families had their sheep in one enclosure and they hired shepherds, in this case we have a faithful shepherd, whose job it was to protect those sheep. And if they were out amongst the pastures in the hills and there was no enclosure near a house, they would often try to find a safe place where the sheep could be corralled and then the shepherd would actually sort of become the gate, be the thing that stood in the way of the sheep moving out, <laughs> right? And so Jesus says, here's the thing, I am the one who loves the sheep, and I am the one who opens a gate to them that is a way of, abund of abundant life. That is what I have to offer, is this way of abundant life. We're also helped by references that are in this text itself. A couple of different times during Lent, you may recall that we read from one of the servant songs in Isaiah, specifically one that's read on Good Friday, Isaiah 52, 13 to 53, 12. That's easy to remember, 52, 13, 53, 12, where the suffering servant is the one who is beaten and humiliated but does not open his mouth, but suffers for the sake of what God has called him to do. Hmm? 
Yep. Like a sheep that before his shear, its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Okay. These two images of the shepherd who loves us and shows us a way to the, the way to abundant life, and the suffering one who is this same shepherd who shows by how he lived and how he suffered and died what that way looks like in the world. That breaking the power of hate and humiliation, predatory actions, the ignorance that keeps us from seeing each other as beloved ones of God, the way through that, First Peter says, is to take on this mind of Jesus, this willingness to stand in the face of whatever they were suffering and to understand a few things. First, it didn't really matter what anybody did to them because their life was protected in God. Second, it didn't really matter what anyone did to them because anything that happened that they suffered would never change God's love for them. Belovedness has nothing to do with what we do or what is done to us. It is there, it is unconditional regardless. And the final thing is accepting the suffering in such a way that God has the possibility to transform it. Okay. Now, First Peter holds out the hope that if people accept their servitude and try to live amongst even those who do them harm, in gentle and generous ways, if they try to do that, that somehow that will change the attitudes of those who are hurting them. Okay. And sometimes that does happen, but we also know that's a slippery slope, right? Stay with them. Maybe if you love them enough, right, they will stop hurting you. No, that's not what this is about here. This is about claiming our belovedness in such a way that we see that our, and understand to the deepest part of our souls that our value has nothing to do with what's out there and what other people tell us. It has everything to do with our rootedness in the life and love of God. I don't know if you guys have ever had this happen but once you lay claim to that truth during a time when you're suffering and bearing under humiliation or disregard or dismissiveness, when you lay claim, when we lay claim to that truth, something inside of us is set free. Death and harm no longer hold power over us, right? We can say to others, you can dismiss me if you want. It does not change the value of who I am. My friends, this is the beginning of uppityness, right? of people understanding, people of God understanding that in God's life, their value is never diminished. Our value is never diminished. And when that begins to set us free, we are then free to make choices in those situations and relationships and issues that are bringing us harm. It doesn't mean our suffering will stop, but it means we can change how we respond to what is happening to us and what people say to us and what people are not willing to listen to about who we are and what matters to us. Right? It allows us to claim our dignity and our voice in ways that become life 
giving because we are set free then to live into the life that God calls us to live. Whatever our context is, whatever our challenges are, whatever the wounds are that we bring with us, all of those things now are set free to bring life to ourselves and to the world around us. First Peter says, remember that you have a shepherd who is a guardian of your soul. A guardian of your life is another way to translate that. This shepherd who loves you and guards your life is the one who will set you free regardless of your circumstances. And so it is this word of life that was given to the first readers of Peter's letters and is now given to us that we can carry with us. It is not a word that tears people down, although some of these words have been used in that way. But this word about sharing how even in our most difficult times, when we are devalued and dismissed by the rest of the world, even shamed by them, we can claim our voice and our dignity because we are children of God. And once you're set free, you don't have to be silent anymore. You can choose to interface with your oppressors in a different way. You can choose to make choices for yourself that help you know and understand that you're living into the life that God has called you to live. And so the text is complicated, but it brings good news because we follow the one who had everything possible done to him and he was set free. In fact, he was in freedom the whole time. That's a whole nother sermon or two or three. He was free, fully free, fully alive to God and to his mission throughout his life. And he is still alive. And he is here for us. And so we can walk this one, the way of this one who suffered as God's servant. And we can remember our belovedness that gives us the capacity to freely move about even in places where it is not safe otherwise. Did I say yet that this is hard work? <laughs> yes, it is. Any of us who have ever had to find our way past harm that has been done to us or dismissiveness that disregarded us, any of us who have had to do that understand that the way forward is not an easy path. But when we know we are beloved of God, then we can walk in that freedom. And then nothing, nothing can shoot us down. Amen. About the shooting image.
Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give thanks for your presence with us this day and for the gift of life that you have given so abundantly. Risen Savior, hear our prayers. We pray for the places and people across the world where suffering is ever present. We particularly lift up the continued war in Ukraine and the war that has broken out again still in Sudan. We pray for all the people that are in harm's way and ask that you come alongside them that they may do all in their power to resist these powers of death that surround them. Risen Savior, hear our prayers. <laughs> 